and that's and that's my uh, <laughs> so. there, my little companion here. <laughs> oh, cute. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Intro to Beetles with Betsy Beatrose. Some of you may have seen Betsy's Intro to Butterfly web Butterflies webinar on March 2nd. If so, you know you're in for a treat. Grow Native is a native plant marketing and education program that serves the lower Midwest, run by the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And I'd like to thank our sponsors for this webinar, which you see on the slide on your screen. My name is Erica Van Brinken. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator for the Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, the Foundation's Executive Director, Carol David, David will read those out to Betsy. This, this webinar is being recorded. The link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. Betsy's lifelong love of insects began in childhood. Then she went on to earn a degree in entomology from Colorado State University, focusing mostly on aquatic insects. She worked for 35 years for the Environmental Department of Johnson County, Kansas, and worked to earn a master's degree from Kansas University in environmental health. She taught environmental science for 15 years, part-time at Johnson County Community College, and found time to write a book on the butterflies of the Kansas City region, which was published in 2008. In her retirement, Beatrice studies and photographs invertebrates on her five acres of land. So far, she has submitted more than 4,000 of her invertebrate images to bugguide.net, including several rare species. And now I will turn it over to Betsy. Okay, thank you. Let's make sure. So, okay, where are we? Oh, can people see me? Yes, Betsy, take it away. Okay, take it away. Okay, well, we'll get out of this slide. Okay, well, once upon a time, there were great beasts arose from the sea and walked on the land, and that started the reign of the dinosaurs. And the dinosaurs appeared and lived throughout the Mesozoic era, which began about 245 million years ago and lasted 180 million years. So dinosaurs were around for a long time, 180 million years. And then, poof, they were gone. So um, there's actually relative to, there's new uh, evidence has come out on a um, fossil site, uh, North, no, I can't remember now where it's. Anyway, the show's on the 15th, April 15th, and you can click on here and get the information, or that one. Well, oh, that's the news, and that's, I don't know, click on both. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, here's the uh, David Attenborough. I'm sure most of you are familiar with him. So, but wait, what am I talking about dinosaurs? Where's the insects? So, we have to go back further. Once upon a really, really long time ago, Insects predate the dinosaurs way back, having they estimate having been here probably at least 400 million years, undoubtedly more. And the, the first winged insects appeared in the fossil record during the Carboniferous area, area period, which was 350 million years ago. Again, probably goes back further. And one of the most complete wings of this would be Protodonta, uh, a precursor, but not really of a Odonata, which is a dragonfly. And this was found in 1939 in Kansas by K-State entomology students. And there was a fantastic insect fossil area in El near Elmo, Kansas. And it was heavily, heavily sought after. And it was, um, but apparently it's pretty well mined, mined out now. They haven't been able to find any more areas in that, in that area of Elmo to find it, but it was a very famous and lots of famous bugs and things have come out of it. Now, this one, uh, the wingspan is about seven and a half inches, which means the, that's one wing. So the wingspan of the complete wingspan is about 15 inches. 
But the, the fo fossil of the insect, largest insect known to have ever lived, is also from Kansas. But it was just a scrap of a wing, but they could extrapolate from that. And it would have a wingspan of over two feet. So that's a, that might actually scare me. But wait, what about beetle fossils? Oh my gosh, there's no beetle fossils. Okay, here is not a beetle fossil, but as an older one. This one has just recently been recognized as the oldest bug, if you want to say bug, the oldest invertebrate, maybe a better term. It's a millipede. It was originally found in 1899, but they have new ways to date fossils. And it's something to do with zircons that are in the soil and radiometric dating, blah, blah, blah. And apparently it's pretty gosh darn accurate. So that's how things are getting uh, redecided how old they are. Anyway, this one, 425 million years ago. And this was in, in Scotland, the island of Kidder. And this uh, is also a hotbed for fossil bugs. But wait, what about the fossils of beetles? Well, there's a beetle. So this is the best, this, this particular individual is the best preserved beetle of anywhere in, in the world. So about hundred million years ago, this little beetle made a wrong turn and flew into a conifer tree where the sap was coming out and was not able to get out. And of course, sap turns into amber and you wind up having these really well, really well uh, preserved specimens. And this one, as well as others, are being found in, uh, unfortunately, political disasters country, Myanmar, which used to be uh, Burma. And uh, again, I've got lots of links in here. So when you go on, if you look at the slideshow later, you can click on things and uh, go to the places. Okay. But wait, this may be the best preserved beetle, but it's not the oldest. This is another beetle that was found in amber. It wasn't a complete beetle like this. This is a, they, they done, did a model of it, extrapolating the different body parts they found. But what's of most interest with it is it was found with pollen on it. So basically saying this beetle, when it was crawling around on flowers, it was getting pollen. So it would crawl around on other flowers. That means it's transferring pollen and is a pollinator. And in fact, beetles are, extremely important pollinators. They get kind of short shrift because people just want to talk about bees, but beetles are extremely important. In fact, there's, yeah, yeah, they are. Okay, but wait, this is only 105 million years ago, but just think about it. These bugs that got stuck in amber 100 million years ago, 100 million years ago, and then somebody finds it 100 million years later. Man, that has to be pretty awesome but it was a discovery of pollination with beetles. So believe it or not, the first known beetle preserved in fossilized poop of a dinosaur ancestor that ate them whole 230 million years ago. So, so and you may not be aware, but their fossilized uh, feces or fossilized poop of dinosaurs is a thing. In fact, I have a, I have a chunk I got from um, one of the rock shows some years back. So I just, I got dinosaur poop. I got to have that. So anyway, so I apparently didn't digest them very well. So these things got pooped out. And so they're the oldest that have been found in uh, dinosaur poop. And there's going to be obviously more research about that. Uh, let's see. And then, yeah. And this is it's a 3D rendering of it which again, makes it, makes it like come alive. But at least poop from 230 million years ago doesn't smell. <laughs> okay. But wait, 230 million years ago. Now you got to give it credit for being found in fossilized poop. So now the wait is over. And it's, I actually couldn't find pictures of this. And as far as the oldest beetle or anything, fossilized, that, that can change change really quick as more research is done. But there's a fossil beetle that was described from the Muzon, um, yeah, Muzon Creek in Illinois, which is a, uh, another hotbed of bugs. 
and it pushes the origin of beetles from 318 to 299 million years ago. So the beetles themselves may, may have been a latecomer, maybe they were before that, probably were, but the first fossilized one. And the discovery of this, there's a link here for the, the paper uh, describing that. So now one last fossil discovery. Ugh. I never thought about ticks being fossilized. I think they've been around too long. I've already had two on me. But ticks also have been found in amber. And not only have they been found in amber, they've been found uh, attached to a feather, because fe of a feathered dinosaur at the time. So these ticks go, and the, these little dinosaurs go back 100 million years ago, and this tick has been preserved in amber, just like you can't, we can't get rid of them. Anyway, again, if you want to read more about it, right there. Okay. Now, believe it or not, beetles are the most successful animal on Earth if you just look at it by sheer numbers of species. Uh, close to 390,000 species worldwide that have been described. And that represents 40% of the known species of insects. So they're a huge part of the insect population. Now, in the United States and Canada, they, we have about 25,000 described species. So if you want to start now and try to catch all those, good luck. But <laughs> there's a lot of beetles out there. So 350 million years of evolution gets you one super cool group of insects. And these beetles display, these are mostly tropical be uh, beetles, but give you a perspective there. So is it fun to study beetles? Well, I kind of think so. Uh, not everybody wants little green scarabs walking on you, but they were so pretty. And they're fun to study just because of the sheer number. There are so many beetles, like I said, 25,000 estimated. And uh, going out and finding them, I mean, I think on my property, I think I'm up to about 500, uh, not necessarily species, but 500 different kinds of beetles. Not all beetles can be identified from a photo. So I keep at it. But anyway, wide variety, all different colors, patterns, shapes, and wings, etc. So we need to look at a little bit about what an insect is. Insects uh, have an exoskeleton. It's on the outside. It still has a similar function to our, our skeleton, like attachment of muscles. And it has three pairs of jointed legs. It has three body segments, the head, thorax, and abdomen. Typically, they have two pairs of wings. Some only have one pair and some have none, and one pair of antennae, and usually one, pa one pair of the compound eyes and, and sim simple eyes called the ocelli. They're just little, little dots on top of the head that probably mostly just sense dark and light. Now, these are the ones that make us, make us, <laughs> these are the characteristics that make us separate, no, insects, insects separate from the other members of phylum Arthropoda, which include the shellfish, spiders, centipedes, and millipedes. And it, sometimes people want to say spiders are bugs or insects, but one thing to note, spiders have two body parts, the head and the thorax are combined, and they have no antenna. So those are the key, key things on trying to figure out if you got an insect or not. Now there's Insects, there's, these are all the current known orders of insects. So from beetles to earwigs, flies, mayflies, cicadas, blah, 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 blah. But what we're gonna be looking at here are the coleoptera, one of many orders of insects, uh, the coleoptera. So who came up with that name? Well, none other than Aristotle. And he named it, it came out beetles in the BC time of life. So it, not like just people currently got interested in bugs, but people have been interested in bugs like Aristotle, long time back. So the coleoptera is derived from uh, the Greek coleopterus. So who came up with the name beetle? Well, that was kind of funny because Old English, no English name comes from Old English, Old English leading into Middle English, 
Bethel or Beetle, and eventually it became Out Beetle. But they were going to change it in the early 60s, and then all of a sudden they realized they couldn't change the spelling because there was some music group came out of the singing Beatles. So uh, not really. So identifying Beatles, you have the opportunity to look at the different life stages. They have four life stages, the egg, uh, larva, pupa, and adult. And this is the same as with uh, butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, bees, and wasps. So identifying eggs, well, good luck. If all you do is find the eggs and you didn't see what laid them, probably not gonna be able to identify them unless you uh, try to rear them. Identifying the larva of beetles is also pretty challenging. You know, there's so many species of insects out there that the lice, that life, they may have the adult identified to a species, but have never worked out the whole uh, life stages because they can't find them in that way. So that's citizen, citizen science. Can, people can do that kind of stuff. Uh, they do form a pupa. Uh, lots of luck with that. I actually, I actually rarely find pupa of beetles, unless ladybugs, but... So identifying adults, well, it is challenging. There's only you know, 25,000 species, <laughs> but it is doable for lots of the insects, lots of the beetle species. And the online sources I use are bugguide.net. This is out of uh, Ames, Iowa State. And there you post your bug picture and see if uh, somebody there will identify it for you. It's a huge site. There's also iNaturalist, which is supported by the Smithsonian and some other groups. And I use it a lot. I don't post to it because it's enough trouble for me to post a bug guide, but I will go on iNaturalist and it has a AI system where I can put the photograph in and it'll come back and tell me what they think it is. And so that's been really helpful. Insects are a little problematic because again, there's so many of them, but it's, it's very, very useful. And if you get into doing your own uh, like if I wanted to on iNaturalist, I could do a project on it just on my five acres. I'm probably not going to do that, but, uh, or if you've got a group of students for a summer, you could have an area that's for them and that's what they're uh, reporting on. So got a lot of, a lot of usefulness to it. But before you even try to identify a beetle, you need to figure out if it is a beetle. So, uh, that's, that can be a challenge, and the group of insects most commonly confused with beetles are the order, suborder Heteroptera, or the true bugs, and the reason there that it says true is not because they're, there's fake bugs, but because the word bug is used, associated with so many insects. Apparently, the most of them that have the word bug were bugs <laughs> in the order Hemiptera. And so it became the true bugs. And the same thing applies to flies, diptera. Those are true flies because then you have um, butterflies, which are not flies. You have dragonflies, which are not flies. So that's how you look at that. It's not like it's you know, fake news. <laughs> so uh, these have uh, their front wings are two, two parted. They have this leathery part and the bottom half is membranous. There we go, show it there a little bit bigger. So we got this leathery part and then the membranous part and then the scutellum, which is usually pretty distinctive on, on uh, hemiptera, not always. Oh, let me back up on that one. Also, they fold their wings over their back in an X shape. And so it also helps you identify them. And then you get some other ones. These are scutellarity, which are the shield back bugs. And you know, first looking at that, you might think they're beetles because they look like beetles, except they got the wrong antenna. And if you flip them over, you see the piercing sucking mouth part that um, hemiptera, members of hemiptera have. They have the piercing sucking to either suck plant juice or suck some critter that they're eating but it completely covers it, but there's still wings and you can see the wings here. So they can still fly. I, I can't imagine real well, but they can still fly. Oh, and the wings are nicely put under there. 
Okay, and I mentioned the had the wrong antenna to, for beetles, and hemiptera generally have elongate a segments to their antenna, and they're four to five. And you're, I'll, you'll see in a minute that beetles are all over the place, but and they can be quite long, but they still have elongated uh, antennal segments. And this is the proboscis because they are a piercing, sucking insect. This one's working on some honey water. I spray on the leaves. And you can see where it's been working uh, over there. So they really like honey water. So bugs have what's called gradual metamorphosis, where you, of course, with your bugs, you got boys and girls have to get together. And the this, these are the wheel bug assassin bugs, and they lay really cool eggs. Oh, I moved. I'm looking at two screens. They lay really cool eggs, which I've never seen, which irritates me. And every one of my ash trees is dead on my property, and I've only seen one adult emerald ash borer, and it wouldn't hold still for a photo. <laughs> How dare you? Um, so when they first hatch out in gradual metamorphosis, the larva, not the larva, the nymphs look a lot like the parents. They're not a caterpillar like in a butterfly. This one uh, is shedding an, its exoskeleton. So this is already, may have already grown one or two uh, stages after hatching. It, it's, uh -oh. Okay. We'll get rid of that. Sorry about that. Um, it'll turn a diff more brown or more gray. So they grow and grow until they outgrow their exoskeleton and then they, they, they wiggle out of it. This is a bigger, bigger, bigger one that's turning a, a ladybug into a wheel bug. Voracious appetite. So if you have if you're a gardener, this is a good guy to have in your garden. Just don't let them poke you with their proboscis because apparently it can really hurt. Eventually, the last uh, st stage they emerge or is the adult stage. They have their wings, wheel bugs. Nobody knows really why they have this wheel shape on top, but it's pretty cool to look at. And you can see the, their antenna, longer antenna, but if you look at close, they're long segments. And then this one was a riot because this is two wheel bugs eating one uh, goldenrod uh, uh, beetle, but one on each end apparently. So I think that beetle had no chance of living. So an introduction to our local beetles. One of the things that fascinates me and others on beetles is <clears throat> the, just the plain shape of the bodies, they, they just all different shapes. So uh, butterflies, you have all different colors and some different patterns on the wing styles and all, but, but beetles, oh my goodness. So it's really exciting when I'm, here, I'm out looking for them or they come to the black light um, whenever I see something new. And any of these that, uh, these that have look like they're on a sheet, those have all been taken um, at a black light on a sheet. So that most of these are that I photographed and then some, uh, we're from like sweep netting. So anyway, the bottle, body forms are cool. Um, the larva, that's a whole nother world that you might or might not wanna get into because you, uh, it's hard to identify beetle larva. And they can be, they can be very sclerotized. And I'll, I'm gonna tell you about what this one is shortly. I'm gonna leave you in suspense. Uh, they can be soft with absolutely only the head has got um, uh, the uh, chitin and or some like this one's a sumac beetle and it's covering its body with poop to avoid being eaten. This is a carrion beetle larva. It's all sclerotized and then some other beetle larva, which I don't know what they are. I think I did know what that one was, but I've forgotten. <clears throat> when beetles emerge and as well as other insects, Sometimes they, it takes a while for them to acquire their full color. And this is, a, a, a it's called the tenoral stage. So this is a tenoral stage. It looks like a bright orange, brand new species to science. And then I saw the white spots up there and I thought, oh, no, that's a seven spotted ladybug, which it was. And eventually they will turn their red and black spots. The seven spotted ladybugs or ladybird beetles 
are ones are one of the ones that's sold through nurseries that for con trying to control aphids in your garden. And as a result, they're all over the place. Now, identifying a beetle. Well, beetles have two pairs of wings and the front part are, is a shell, what looks like a shell on most of them. It's usually leathery or hardened. And it, it's not like what I just showed you with a heteroptera where they're, it's uh, leathery here and membranous there. And some species, the elytra, which is a protective cover there, and some species like robe beetles, the elytra are short for whatever reason. And then the membranous wings have to get up under there to stay safe. And then another big thing is that beetles, this is a tiger beetle, and beetles, the, the elytra usually meet straight down the back. Oh, hold it. Oh, there's the membranous wings. <laughs> Um, there's the beetle, the lines. So it's a straight line, as opposed to what I showed you in the previous slide is the hemiptera, they form a, form a uh, or the heteroptera, they form an X. Now insects are the only group of insects, the only group of invertebrates that have evolved wings and flight. No other invertebrate can fly. And unlike vertebrates, like birds, wings or birds and bats, Wings were not legs. They are actually a unique bodily appendage for the insect. So kind of fascinating. And then again, I didn't take this picture, but again, if you want to take a look at it, there's the connection to it. So the idea that these bugs, these beetles, and I still say bugs, lots of entomology people say bugs. It's just sometimes easier. Anyway, these are beetles. So how do they let these wings unfold and then how to get they get folded in? Well, glad you asked. So I'm gonna show you a little bit, some researchers, and that's this article here, you can um, pull up and read all about it in great detail. But it took off half of the elytra on a ladybug, got a mold there and made a clear section, shown as blue here, but it's a clear section then they glued back on the ladybug to observe the wing folding underneath. So, and all these uh, videos are in that article too. So this is one, this one is showing the, uh, just a regular old beetle hasn't been changed. And the elytra go up first, they're not involved with flight. And then the membranous wings go out. But then after they go out, they gotta come back. And in this one, this, oh, let me get rid of Ooh, get rid of that one. Okay. Anyway, this is the one. Uh, oh, actually, watch down on the abdomen. The abdomen here. Let me back up a little bit. Da, 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 da. The abdomen is actually moving and it's helping bringing the uh, membranous wings back up under the elytra. But they're going in a very organized manner. They're not just getting squished there. So there's that picture. And then the next one is actually viewing it through the uh, clear part. So here's the one that had a, had a modified wing. And so that researchers could then look through that clear part of their wing. And if you read the article, it's got incredible, uh, uh, whatever you call it, plates, whatever, of the origami, because that's about all you can do to describe about beetles is that it's origami, it's paper folding. And they've worked out uh, lots of ways it happens and a lot more detail than what that, that is. And then one thing they discovered by doing that is that wings, when they fold up under the elytra, actually aren't, don't smash under there. They actually have some poof to them. And that probably makes sense because if they got smashed, they might get sticky and not, not come out. And then, oh, the next one, uh, one more, and again, you can look here on YouTube is the one a rove beetle and it's you know, if you don't laugh watching it i'd be surprised because i laughed anyway oops what was that oh oh full screen okay oh start complicated so this is a rove beetle insects are forever bathing themselves cleaning themselves off 
So they're very clean. When people say insects are dirty, people are dirtier. So now watch how, the, how those membranous wings are gonna get up under that, those elytra. So just watch as the abdomen starts to wiggle back and forth. And again, this is very organized how it's done and it's getting it squished under the elytra and then on its way. Oops. Uh-oh, let's see. Oh, sorry. Ah, there we go. Okay. But again, you can find all those too if you're interested in them or interested in showing them to others or making your own slideshows. Okay. Well, looking up close to beetles, you're going to find that the mouth parts, beetles uh, have chewing mouth parts, unlike the hemipter that have piercing sucking. And you look at the chompers on this uh, uh, tiger beetle, big chompers there. And even on this larva, big chompers there. So piercing sucking. And their antenna of the adult is usually uh, 11 segmented, more or less, unlike the um, hemiptera, which is four to five. And they do vary in shape a lot, which I'll show you shortly. The three body parts is the head, um, mouth on the head. Oh, let me get my little magnifier. Okay. This is the top of the, the, this beetle. So we've got the three, you can see the three body parts there. And then here it's upside down so you can see a little better. So on the mouth, mouth, the antenna and the mouth are, and the eyes are on the first, on the head, which in this case is not a really big head at all. Because then it starts into the thorax, and the thorax is divided into three part segments. And on each segment, a one pair of legs is attached. And that's on the thorax that the legs are attached as well as the wings are attached. Then you get down here, and there's the abdomen. So, another thing, uh, they, uh, bugs have to eat just like we do. And they, they chew up their food and they actually, they actually produce sal salivary, they have salivary glands and they produce saliva. And the saliva is mixed with the uh, food they're chewing up at first and then swallowed with the uh, uh, saliva. And it mixes with the food and starts breaking it down here. And then the large food particles are in the foregut here. And they're being broken down also by saliva. There's also a crop somewhere in there for food storage. And then the midgut right here is where most of the digestion takes place. And it takes place through enzymes, not, not like termites that need microfauna, phone, uh, microfauna in their insides to digest the cellulose of wood. So in the hindgut back here, that's where the undigested food is. And it joins with uric acid from the Malphigian tubules. I had, I had to put that in because that, that's just a hilarious name to me. So anyway, so the, and what's being formed based clear is fecal pellets. And then out they go. <laughs> so the, an, the antenna of beetles, which is so cool. There are so many different kinds and this just is a sampling. Again, these are all around, well, they're all around Kansas City's region they're probably all part of the eastern region as well, eastern United States. Uh, so people get, that's one thing people get real excited about. Some to, to detect pheromones of the, their mates. This one is to hold on to the, this is the male to hold on to the female when it's this blister beetles mating, uh, longhorn beetles. Anyway, lots of different shapes, which I don't know, for some reason I find fascinating. And I did in, starting in college. Now they do breathe because everybody has to breathe. And this uh, grub I showed you a few slides back is a great one. You know, if you're trying to show kids something or even adults, you know, most people, they dig up a grub in their garden, they just throw out for the birds to feed on. And I used to do that, but I don't do that anymore. All insects have spiracles that's, and they're often decorated. These aren't heavily decorated, but all these spots here are spiracles, they're holes. And you can see off this one, trachea, little tiny tubes, and oxygen comes in 
and then is bathed over all the organs. They don't have lungs. And then after cellular respiration, when the uh, cells are using oxygen to burn uh, glucose, basically, they release carbon dioxide, just like we breathe out carbon dioxide. And they, it also goes out these holes. So, I mean, it's just a set of squishing something like, oh, maybe there's something cool about it. And you can study this. <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, insects do have a circulatory system, but it doesn't carry oxygen. You know, our circulatory system, why, why are we breathing? We breathe into our lungs and then the blood, it, uh, aorta picks up the oxygen through our lungs and distributes to every cell in the body. Uh, bugs are mostly plasma and usually green or yellow. And when I was a youngster, you'd be out driving. I really did. It was a long time. I was dead set sure that bugs, the inside of bugs was green goo because that's all you see on the, on the window. But nope, they're very involved. They got lots of body parts. They're a little different from ours, but they still have them. Okay, lifestyles of beetles. Well, uh, some are predators eating other bugs or maybe some other things. Herbivores, that's, those are the vegetarians. Scavengers eating dead and dying stuff, rotting stuff. And parasitoids. Uh, the word parasitoid is used because um, Insect parasitoids opt, don't, uh, they basically kill the host. So if a female lays an egg on a, a beetle and it burrows its, when the caterpillar hatches out, it burrows itself into the body and over time chews up the insides to feed it. And that is the end of that beetle or a larva or whatever. Whereas a parasite doesn't necessarily kill, kill its uh, host. So that's where the word parasitoid comes from. And plus, beetles are everywhere. Now, uh, as far as the first step, maybe to start with, is the scavengers. Because when you have dead things, whether it's a dead tree or vegetation or dead animals, something needs to uh, decompose it. And this is a raccoon. I, I have a sunroom out on one side of my house, which, but there's a big window inside the house, so I can see. Anyway, one day I kept saying vultures, there are vultures on my roof. I'm like, what are they doing there? I don't want vultures to nest on my roof. So I finally came out and found this, which was a poor raccoon that had died. But then it's like, oh, cool. And this is in a raised bed. So I could just stand there and take the pictures. So a lot of different bugs feed on it. And there's different orders or different uh, orders, not uh, steps of what bugs come in when, and that's where forensic entomology comes in because you learn the life cycles of the insects and the life cycles, how long the egg is, the adult, the pupa, all that stuff. And uh, you can, for forensic entomology, you're setting you know, a body and when it died. So this is a, this is a, um, this eats the hair. This is a carrion beetle. I'll talk about that here shortly. This is a blue, uh, it's called, I think it's called a blue bone eater. This guy chews on bones. And road beetles, number of road beetles are scavengers. And this is a larva of something, a beetle, but of something. This is a, oh, I, I'm, I'm on the wrong screen. I'm sorry, I got, I hear no feedback. And then I got these, um, I gotta re keep remembering to go back to this screen. Anyway, this is a, a carrion beetle. This is a blue bone beetle. This is a rogue beetle, which is it's this particular type or, or scavengers. This would be a beetle larva because it's got this heavily sclerotized area here, which is the thorax and a, one pair of legs on each of them. This is a dermestid, dermestidae, which is um, uh, dermestid, carpet, carpet, oh shoot. <laughs> These are the, the dread of people who collect ins have insect collection. Domestic beetles that will devour anything organic, but they're very useful helping break down the crud that's on the, the, the dead animal. Another carrion beetle, another one. Oh, and you'll also sometimes on carrion beetles, you'll find, you'll see that they have a lot of um, mites on them. Now these are not parasites. These are actually hitchhikers and they'll hitchhike, they'll, hop onto the beetle because these 
uh, mites eat fly eggs at de decomposing places like dead animals. So they hop onto the beetle and when it flies to a dead animal, then they hop off to eat the fly larva or fly eggs. And sometimes the beetles can be almost totally covered with those guys. Okay, well, this is, I don't know which, this is the larva of one of the carrion beetles, but these are some examples of carrion beetles uh, around my house. Not, most adults don't actually consume the flesh. They actually, mostly, most of them eat the fly larva, and it's just the immature stage that's busily chowing down on the rotting flesh. Uh, this one is Nicophorus orbiculus. This one actually has parental care. She'll, uh, get a carcass of a tiny animal like a mouse or a, I don't know how I don't know how big of an animal she can carry but she'll dig out under it and then the little guy will be down there and she lays her eggs on it and then she stays with the care she stays with the the eggs and then when the little guys hatch she chews on the food and regurgitates it and feeds them so that's pretty serious hmm. pretty serious home home uh, mom there American uh, beetle, uh, another one. Now this one though, this is a little devil right here. This is in the same genus as this guy, but it's reported to be a brood parasite of other microphora, necrophora, forest. So it would invade the nest, uh, eat up maybe all the eggs or the larva, and then turn around, lay their eggs in there. And then like this mom, she would wind up raising those. Life is tough. Uh, another one they're mating here. This one eats a lot of fly larva and more fly, more fly larva. And then uh, on this bit, it was just like, I mean, something out of some sci-fi movie. So it just, it was just teeming with these things that you'd think and you'd see in the shallow waters of the inland seas of the ancient times far back. Uh, but they're doing their job. So another group then relative to taking care of stuff, decaying stuff, are the dung beetles. And they get their name because dung is, dung is part of their life. Most of them will have a, a flat part here. This one actually got another one of those little hitchhiker be, uh, mites. Flat, kind of like a scoop that they can scoop the uh, dirt or the dung. And they can, um, uh, some of them, what you've probably seen pictures or movies of, they actually roll the dung, they, on their, they have their hind legs up on the dung roll and that's, they're rolling it. And they've laid their egg in the middle of it. So I always tell people, you know, if you're really mad at your parents right now, just be glad your parents weren't dung beetles because then you get stuck in dung so this was this some dung. This would have been a deer, deer dung. <laughs> uh, and this is what came out of it, these gorgeous rainbow uh, scarabs. These are female, and the male has a kind of a rhinoceros horn up there. Another group of insects busy with helping with decay is the longhorn beetles, or serambicity. We've got like 400 species east of here. They, they are a popular beetle to collect because they're they're also great change diversity. So they're kind of really can be looked at as, as nature's uh, first step in wood recycling. Uh, most species feed with dead, dying, or de decaying wood. Uh, like, uh, yeah, some actually use living plant tissue. Some feed on roots, like this is a milkweed longhorn beetle. If you've ever grown milkweed, you've probably have seen these guys. The larva feed externally on the roots. Oh, oh, let me go back up to here. Oh, living plant tissue. Yeah, this is a, what's called a twig girdler. And I have them out at my place. I, I just, it's so fun when I start seeing all these twigs, uh, like about like that. Well, no longer than that. I gotta see where this is. That's something. So low twigs, and they have this perfectly chewed around spot. Well, she doesn't chew all the way around, but she just does chew enough. And then she puts the egg in there. And then later it, it, it'll fall because obviously it's not going to live anymore with the 
this being girdled all the way around. And that's where the uh, larva feed on, feed on that twig that she gave them. Anyway, they fall on my deck and I just kind of smile because I think, oh, I know who's up there. Many adults uh, feed on flowers, on the uh, anther, no, shoot, the um, pollen and the nectar. Pollen is, of course, real high in protein, uh, often colorful. If you're out in the prairie, you're going to see these uh, ones. They're very common out in the prairie, multiple species. And, you know, they're eating cellulose, and cellulose is very hard to digest. That's like why cows have multiple stomachs, because they actually can't digest grass. Uh, they need multiple stomachs to do it and, and uh, other microbes to uh, take care of it. So as a result, these can, uh, longhorn borers can have pretty long life lifespans. And this was fascinating. Typical one to, one to three years, two to three months, and then somebody has documented one with decades. And I would like to look that one up because that would be fascinating. And again, um, that it's enzymes in their digestive system that's breaking down the, their, the cellulose. Okay, these are a few more of the be uh, longhorn beetles around here. This is, a, this is a big one here. It's probably three quarters of an inch. If it runs into your window at night, it makes a pretty good bang. Um, usually it feeds on rotten wood, again, so it's not a, not a, a tree killer. I love finding these. These are elderberry. Uh, wood bore, uh, elderberry borers. They're beautiful. There's kind of bluish tint and the bright orange and more blackish tint there. And so the larva in this group feed on the roots of elderberry bushes. And I just, I planted two, two different elderberry bushes at my house because I'm, I'm hoping I will get some of these sometime. This is a tiny one. It uh, mines dead branches of various plants. But look at these proud proud long antenna longer than the body. And this, this is a one feeding on flower. Again, this is a flower longhorn like I just showed you in the previous picture. Again, taking nectar and pollen uh, from the flowers. Uh, again, their, their larvae are mostly feeding on dead, dead wood. Now this one, this is a beautiful one. If you come across this one, because it, yeah, it may be close to an inch, maybe not three quarters of an inch, but it's big. And it's uh, it's feed, feeds on the larvae feed on false indigo. That's not false indigo there, but and larvae feed on that. And they bore into it and feed on it. And this is the beetle that comes out of it. So that's a gorgeous one. These are these are these are often seen, especially if you've got firewood, because they're in dead and dying wood, um, especially hickory and persimmon. And you might actually have these um, hatching out of your house if you bring firewood in. But again, dead and dying stuff. Now this one, which I think is just a really cool looking one, which I caught in a pretty good motion of its wings opening up. This one uh, does feed on hardwoods, uh, live ones. And then the monster, and it's almost as big as that screen. Not, not really, but it's about an inch long, big brown guy called the tile horn creonis. And that's just because of kind of the antennal joints or segments are kind of like tile, like there. And uh, they do live on living stuff. They're living on uh, roots of mostly oak. Well, chestnut, we don't have that. But um, great pear and corn. But these are, I mean, these are big. I mean, there are, in the tropics, there's even bigger ones. But I don't know. I just, it's just fun when I see some of these. They're like old friends. I said, oh, hi. I, I saw you last year. <laughs> Now, another group of beetles that bore into wood are the family Buprestidae or metallic wood boring beetles. And the larvae in these cases burrow into roots and logs. And they're actually feeding on the, the trouble with them is that they're feeding on the green, the growing part. So, and I forgot to take a picture. I had a, I had a ash tree taken down and of course there's the beetle. The emerald ash borer is a Buprestid. And the larva, uh, yeah, hold it <laughs> there. The larva are called flathead borers because they're flat because they're right under the cambium layer, which is a growing layer. And they're just, and what happens with the EABs is that they just wind up girdling the tree and 
hopeless. And millions and millions of ash trees in the eastern United States are gone. But uh, this, they are characterized by these flatheads. Uh, there's these little tiny ones that uh, the adults feed on flowers. You, you definitely will find them in the prairie. And here's just a few that I found around here. Um, it persimmon, this one, a wide variety of stuff, and blah, blah, blah there. This is a really tiny one. It's only about four millimeters, and it's a you know, beautiful bronzy gold, gold color. And I get them. Actually, I get them every year. And then these are some of the ones that uh, on flowers are real striking. This one is actually is actually eating the petals of this uh, Ruelia or petunia, wild petunia. And this one is uh, bores into redbud trees. Okay. Okay. The next family we'll go over are the ground beetles, and it's it's one of the largest insect families. It has about 34,000 species here. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> I read that wrong. 34,000 species worldwide and about 2,440 in North America and North of Mexico. Sometimes you'll see a designation that way because North, North Mexico is North America. But if you include North, if you include Mexico, in with the bug stuff, the diversity like grows logarithmically. So they really need to be handled separately. So most things are referring to insects, your field guides and stuff. It's those in the United States and Canada. These guys are real speedy little devils because they're, they're predators. They, they're mostly on the ground, not all of them. Some, some are vegetarians. The larvae are, uh, predators, but some are parasitoids. So these guys can live up to three years. This is a fiery searcher, which is a caterpillar hunter. And I've actually seen them climb a tree and just cut right into the fall webworm webbing and has a feast on the fall webworm caterpillars. Beautiful beetle though. And they, uh, ground beetles come in all different shapes and sizes. These are mostly photographed at my lights. In fact, they all are, except this beautiful one. This one, every year, somehow I'm walking on my sidewalk and I see this, I, I know it's not the same one, this beautiful beetle, and it's a really fast beetle. And I don't know why, because it feeds on snails. <laughs> so it doesn't have to go fast for that. Uh, but, you know, just another, you know, lots and lots and lots of field of uh, those guys. Now these are also part of that group, but we go, this is a genus, the Libia, colorful foliage ground beetles. And most of them can be real, you look for these on flowers and plants. They're, they're lesser to be on the ground hunting for something, for food, they'll be on plants. <clears throat> and these are just a few of those. Some of them are brightly colored like that one. This is the large foliage ground beetle. Why do I have that? Oh, that's right. They're an important, they parasitize Colorado potato beetle, which is that. And so they're a very important uh, biocontrol of the very pesky Colorado potato beetle. They also uh, parasitize the um, asparagus beetle, which if you grow asparagus, you've probably seen them. Okay, the next group of ground beetles are tiger beetles. And tiger beetles used to be in a set their own family and then they got converged into uh, ground beetles for some reason. Um, and they're, they're really, a lot of them are really strikingly marked. This one, uh, uh, tiger beetles, the elytra back here are usually kind of parallel on each side, not all the time, but usually. And then the uh, thorax is, is smaller than the top of the elytra and smaller than the head. And then the head is kind of bulgy. Their eyes are kind of bulgy. They have long legs here and they, cause they can travel fast. So even to catch one for photographing, oh my gosh, I've had some adventures there, but boy, do they have the chompers there. 
this is one I found, I was coming out of it my gym one day and this was running along the side of the curb. And I thought, wow, I don't have that one. And I thought, it's just gonna get run over by a car. So I had a you know, drink in my hand. So I dumped out where the drink was so I could catch this one, take it home and take a picture of it. And then I let it go. So you have these adventures. Uh, a couple other here. This is a common one too, and um, not as common. And then, come on, oops, well, there it comes. It's coming, okay. This green one, and if you've ever paid attention to beetles or bugs, you probably, I'm sure you've seen these. These will come out and there'll just be lots of them out there. And it's called the six spotted tiger beetle. And you'll notice you can count the spots. No, you can't because <laughs> sometimes they have spots and sometimes they don't, but there's nothing, there's no other one around this area. There's one up north that is similar. Uh, no around here that is anything but the six spotted tiger beetle. It's very common and it is absolutely gorgeous. On tiger beetles, the larva typically occur in the same area the adults do. And what's cool is that the um, beetle, I mean the larva, they actually bore a little hole and they, they got a hook on the back end, part of their abdomen so that something can't pull them out. And then they sit in that little hole with their little chompers right up there and just wait for something to walk by and they have lunch. Uh, this is another one that's long lived larva, two to three years to complete. And where would be where would summers be if it wasn't for lightning bugs? It would be oh, not as fun. <clears throat> Family Lampyridae, these are fireflies. Fireflies, they that's not a fly. People call them fireflies, lightning bugs. Everybody knows what you're talking about. Uh, more officially, it would be the uh, uh, fire. Hold it. What is fireflies? Fire beetles. Lightning. Oh. <laughs> Lightning, sorry, lightning bugs or lightning beetles. Yeah, oh, there we go, it's right there, lightning beetles. Um, when you have common names that, uh, like this is a common name for the, the lightning bug, but since it's not our lightning or fireflies, it's not a fly. So the common word fly and the this part of the word are one word. Uh, it, you would do the same with lightning bugs, but by calling it the lightning beetle, that's actually the correct way to do it. And when you do that, uh, it's a separate, it's two different words. It's something to learn. So, but in summer, yeah, where would you be without lightning, lightning bugs? Sorry, I'll do bugs. This is a little cute little guy. This is a little video. Again, you can find that on YouTube. <clears throat> so a couple, I'll just go over a couple um, lightning bugs. Uh, these are all around here. And uh, this is Futurus, and then females, little deadly females, mimic, they're, they're down in the grass, they're mimicking the flash patterns that the females of other genera, particularly Photinus, and so the males are lured down to their death to be consumed. <laughs> and apparently they do this for added nutrition. They might content, get chemical defenses because lightning bugs are full of a uh, are definitely have, are, have a lot of protection from uh, the chemicals in their body. There's not a lot known about their mating behavior and all because they're, they grow um, up in trees, high trees, but I do get them at the lights. And then um, this is the one, this is the poor one that gets lured in by the female of the Photurus, but this is Photinus. Uh, they're, they're mating, another one. So, Again, lightning bugs don't necessarily flash all night long. They will have different species will come out at different times to flash. And there's a book and I sent um, Erica a, a short list of books to, that you might be interested in. There's a whole book on lightning bugs, glow worms, and it's really well done. It's all, all for every species in Eastern United States. So she'll send that out tomorrow with the email. Betsy, this is Carol. What? I'm sorry to break in. I just wanted to remind you, we, we ha will have to sign off in 15 minutes. It's five o'clock. So, oh, no. um, and we do have quite a few questions. I know your material is wonderful, um, but I just wanted to give you a little update on the time. Thank you. I'll talk fast. 
I'm already talking fast. Okay, this one, beetle, this the larva I showed you before, is this absolutely bizarre thing. It looks like it came from the dinosaur ages and it forms the pupa, which I think is from Klingon's style. And you'll be seeing those now. I, I see these crawling up the side of my house and then they're making their, their pupa. Now, real quick, I, I'm not gonna read any of this. Synchronous fireflies in the Smoky Mountains. If you've never heard about this, there are species, a species of firefly there, which have a synchronous emergence. They're all, they're all coming up the same time. They're all flashing the same time. And it's an incredible scene. I've not seen it, but it's so popular. There's a lottery and that's what all that information is. Uh, you have to put your name in. If your name's drawn, you're given a day and time that you can um, come watch them. And you might or might not get it, but this photo is by Linda Williams. She went to see them uh, last year. But wouldn't this be, I mean, just, they're everywhere. So, so they're a synchronous firefly. And there's only a few spots in the United States that this species occurs. <clears throat> and it's this Photinus carolinus. This is a picture of those. Uh, glow worms, also glow. These are the larvae. These are the adults that come to the lights. They have really tiny elytra right there. But these are the males. The females don't come to the light. And um, females look a lot like the larva. They're called larva form females. Uh, but the females, larva, females, and the larvas, they feed on millipedes. Adults don't, but they're really cool, be it bugs. They glow in the dark. Oh my gosh, 15 minutes. Oh, well, of course, you'll have this slideshow to look at. Family Chrysomelody are the leaf beetles. I like those. They're just a lot of different colorations. Um, this is your asparagus one. If you, you probably know if you have asparagus. Lots of different varieties, uh, colorful. There's flea beetles. They have muscular legs. You can see a muscular hind legs, and they jump like a flea. Uh, a variety of those. Some of them are, are big pests on garden plants. Others aren't. These just feed on flowers. This one feeds on, um, I can't remember the mint now, but well. These are a type of uh, leaf beetle that the mom is so sweet. She makes this nice little house to put her the egg in and she makes this nice little house out of poop. And then the caterpillar hatches and then the larva can stay safe in here, poking its head out to feed. Okay, and there's some more. And these, these, this one I found in a swimming pool in a subdivision. And uh, it's apparently a fairly scarce species. And there's a, somebody on Bug Guide must have a swimming pool because almost all his pictures are posts of bugs that he's pulled out of the strainer from the pool. So a pretty good place to be looking for bugs. Tortoise beetles have these, they look like tortoise because their shells all over there. Uh, they use poop to disguise themselves too. Apparently things don't like poop. This is the larva of the Monarda, the bergamot tortoise beetle. They're all covered with their little poopies. Uh, three years I got, think of, they devoured all the, mo the Monarda in my, gar my, my prairie. It came back the next year and uh, I've never had a, that large of a number at, ever since. And here's some more views. There's the pupa. Oh, I do have a pupa of a caterpillar. <laughs> Beetle. Another one that this is a beetle that the larva mine into uh, uh, goldenrod, solidago. And this is another interesting one that I can't remember what it does. Click beetles are fun. Uh, and you can read this when you look at it again. These actually feed on wood boring uh, larvae. So they're important. They're important predator. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Huh. Well, I did have a video in part embedded there, but it disappeared. Hairy fungus, the spores on fungus are eaten by different beetles, uh, mildew, things like that. These are little tiny, they're in the ladybird family, 20 spotted lady beetle, kidney spotted. And these uh, feed on what mildew. And these are tiny little beetles. And there's a bunch of beetles. <laughs> this is a uh, bunch of, this is the Asian lady beetle that has all different patterns. It's also sold at uh, stores for 
controlling aphids and it's all over the place now too. This was a cool one to find because it came out of the, came down from the trees. It's the 15 spotted lady beetle that doesn't um, usually come down, it feeds up in the trees. And as it ages, it darkens and the little dots disappear. Oh, golly do it. I really thought I was gonna make this through. Oh, scarab beetles, that's a June bug. Uh, lots of different things that they eat. These are the, everybody loves the Japanese beetles that devour everything, uh, another foreign one. Some people don't like these because they can be eat quite a bit, but I just love the green. The scarab, the stag beetles, that's the male, that's female. Uh, yes, they're cool. This is another favorite beetle that comes to the light. This guy, the larvae feed on dead stuff and dead wood and the adults feed on leaves. Hairy scarabs, you can see these guys are important pollinators. Dark flower scarabs. Uh, be <laughs> God, weevils, weevils. And weevils are, this is a head clipping weevil. This is a sunflower. And the female will clip the top there and she won't clip it off. And then she lays her eggs in the, the flower head. And that's where the uh, little guys um, grow. And then eventually, obviously, it falls off. And this is obviously another one that's important for pollination. This is one that has been at the flower, fully pollinated. And my favorite beetles, these are just, I think, cute as a button, nut and acorn beetles. This is actually the mouth. The mouth is right here. Mm, you can read about that. Grove beetles are important predators. Uh, here's an assortment of the grove beetles I get at my lights. This is a couple that are, these are important predators. They destroy eggs and young maggots. So they're good on that control. These guys are important for control of army worms. Blister beetle is a fascinating story. They have multiple life stages. It's called hypermetamorphosis. That each, they change their appearance. They have the, the triangulum, which will latch on to a host, but they go through a carob stage, at, coarctic stage, scarab stage, pupa, where they look all look like different bugs. Okay. Here's the triangulans. Uh, they emit a pheromone to attract bees and they can get a lot of triangulans on them. And then the male, this is a male they've attracted. And then he goes back, he finds a female to mate with and then they hop onto her and then they get in the nest and they eat everything. The buttercup. They eat uh, blister beetles. This is a cantharidin that can bug you. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, oop. Okay. There's a lot of beetles in the water, but the adults come to the lights. I got a wide variety of beetles at the water beetles at the lights. These are scavenger beetles. Uh, they, if you turn them over, this one has a keel, which is the, the dead giveaway that it's this beetle. We have the fun whirligig beetles and their predators and lots of information there, lots of information there. Okay, and the last of the water beetles are the little riffle beetles. Riffle, riffles in a creek are where you have a slight change of altitude. And so there's, you know, the water's riffling and these guys the larvae live in those as well as the adults but the adults also readily come to lights okay beetles one part of a lot of other bugs as you notice i like insects and spiders i think community service is really important on promoting the goodness of bugs you know think first before you swoosh and i consider it a fascinating world out there and once a person opens their eyes to it I think can bring a lifetime of endless joy. So observing and learning about the lives of all those little critters we share the planet with, I consider is very humbling. The end. <laughs> Betsy, this is fantastic, wonderful. There are so many compliments to you in the chat and we do have about five minutes for questions and there are several which I will uh, get through. 
okay. as many as I can. And I do want to let everybody know that a couple of things. Becky mentioned the importance of citizen science. And um, on April 27th, that's our next webinar, and it's going to be on citizen science. We're going to talk about- Was that a perfect segue or what? Oh, you just, that was great. <laughs> Um, we're going to have three different panelists, one talking about iNaturalist, one talking about eBird, and one talking about the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas. Um, oh, good, so good. Do, do join us for that. And also, um, you are all welcome to join our Prairie Bio Blitz on June 4 and 5. Um, you can watch for information about that in our e-newsletter and our website, but uh, there will be numerous uh, group leaders uh, leading out on the prairie to study as many species as we can. And there will be somebody uh, speaking about beetles. Oh, cool. So, and Betsy, of course, we would love to have you there if you are available. This will be at our prairie that we purchased last year in uh, um, St. Clair County. So I just want to let everybody know about those upcoming events. Lots more webinars. We have prairie hikes, uh, many in, in May. Um, but I'll, let me get to some questions here. Okay. Uh, goldenrod soldier beetles seem to eat pollen, are they? I heard these beetles are probably the best pollinators worldwide because there are so many of them. Is this accurate? Well, I don't know if there's a measurement of them, but apparently the, nothing eats them because there are so many in the fall chowing down on the uh, goldenrod. Worldwide, I don't know. I have no idea on that, but, but beetles are as a whole, as a group, very important pollinators, but they are active there. They're eating the pollen because it's full of um, protein because it's basic, pollen is basically sperm. It's the male part of the deal and it's full of uh, uh, protein. So it's real important. Yeah, they get, they just get covered with protein, uh, covered with um, pollen. Thank you. Um, someone asks, are any beetles poisonous? And maybe, maybe we should say, are there any that are poisonous or any that are venomous? Venomous, venomous. In other words, I guess there's some that might be poisonous if something else ate them. Yeah, but, I can't but, think. Uh, there might be something that actually can bite and be poisonous. I, I don't know on that one. But yeah, as far as having poison, uh, the blister beetle uh, can kill you if you ate it, but you're not going to eat it because it has a cantharidin in it, which is, has historically also been used to um, remove blisters. Your doctor may have put some of that on that because it blisters up the mole, the, uh, yeah, the mole it comes off in theory. Uh, it also is the source of an aphrodisiac, which is no longer allowed, but um, I hate to have just the idea of aphrodisiac blister beetles. <laughs> um, <laughs> monarch, uh, that's, uh, so yeah, I think I had uh, what one, one of those in there, I can't remember now, uh, has poison. Oh, oh, the lightning bugs are their chemicals are very poisonous. So uh, predators learn real quick not to eat them. So they're quite protected there. So, and I'm sure there's plenty others. Because mm -hmm. I mean, when you're when you're at the bottom of the food chain, as I like to say, is everybody wants to eat you. So That's there are right. all sorts of ways to try to avoid that. I can attest that the wheel bug does inflict a painful bite. My son tried to pick one, was handling one when he was about five years old, and he learned about how they, uh, uh, their, their bite. Um, there, Eric mentions there is one venomous longhorn beetle, tropical, that can sting with the tip of its antenna. What? I didn't, the antenna stings you? Yes. Oh, a tropical one? Yes. Wow, Who, what's it normally sting? I don't know, maybe Eric will let us know. Oh, is that, um, uh, there's one, yes, he, he mentioned it. Yes, and, and of course, yeah, Eric is saying assassin bugs are not beetles. Um, of course, they're, they're not. Oh, they're, yeah, they're bugs. Yeah, that whole section was to educate you on bugs versus beetles because that those two groups are what get confused real easily. As a question about the larvae of uh, a number of beetles that we can, can call grubs, um, is, is, is since there there are we might encounter the the grubs of Japanese beetles. Um, yeah, it might be okay, kind of hard. To, Japanese it, beetle grubs feed on roots. Is it is it possible to differentiate the difference between Japanese beetle grubs and grubs of other beetle species? I don't know on that. You probably uh, probably Google it or talk to your extension agent uh, on 
controlling them, but they are they are underground, so you're not going to see them uh, feeding on roots. Um, I don't know. A couple summers ago, they were all over the place, and the last or no, I wasn't there last year, but the summer before, there were hardly any. But I know people that got a lot of them. If you know anybody that has chickens, chickens love to eat eat them. Yes, Mandy says they have hair patterns on their bum. Okay, that could be. I'm sure there's plenty of information on it because it's um, it's a well studied pre uh, pest species. I don't I do a lot of pest stuff. <laughs> I want to I want to share that in the in the chat, someone has compared. Says you are the Julia Child of etymology. Entomology, you bring the joy <laughs> along with the knowledge. Oh, wow, wow. Thank other you. people other people are, are making that, uh, agree with that. Um, well, thank you so very much, Betsy, and uh, everyone for, for joining us. And Erica will send out a link to the recording tomorrow along with uh, many of the uh, references and resources that uh, Betsy mentioned today. So thank you very much, Betsy, and everyone have a great night and enjoy looking at insects this growing season and beyond. Think, think before you squish. <laughs> thank you so much, Betsy. Have a good night, everyone. Yes, Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.